Okay. And we're back in action. Can people hear me and see me? Okay, so I see the panelists already. I have one request. Please hover on top of your own image. And to the top right, you'll see three little dots. Can you click on that and then rename yourselves from the uh, generic uh, panelist speaker name to your actual name? Uh, oh, everybody's here. That's just fantastic. So thank you for coming back. And uh, to the audience, and uh, we're in our second half of the inaugural Osmocosm Conference, coming to you live from MIT and around the planet. We've had a fantastic morning session. We've had an idea from come and a lot of Q and A, um, and it's a very dynamic conference where we ask the audience to participate actively by creating art and questions, and the questions are all being recorded and passed on to the speakers. And uh, I, we do ask the speakers to stay within their five minute limit. And then we give them an opportunity to revisit uh, during the Q&A, which this time we, we, with the permission of Chris Rose, who rise, runs the Ideathons, we will try and have them flow into the next Ideathon and have also the audience, uh, if you can stay for longer, that would be fantastic. Yeah. So it is my um, pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Kralishek. He and I met uh, in a cafe in uh, New Zealand in a very wonderful <laughs> and sort of haphazard way. And um, he has been um, working on noses for a long time. And he told me so much about New Zealand, including how a big problem, which I never considered, is the, uh, the smelling of the maturation of fruit. And we're talking about a, a possibly an over a billion dollar business for New Zealand is just the kiwi fruit alone, which of course has to be shipped over 2000 miles and then to make sure that it matures on time. So he has uh, done a lot of work since I met him. And his site is fantastic, uh, has beautiful pictures of insects, which is something that we should all consider because unlike mammals who have this apparatus to wet and hydrate the, the airstream for us to send and to sense, insects usually have their antenna float, flopping in the wind. They have slightly different receptors for odor. So they might be a very good um, and important pathway into it. So with no, no more um, intro, I'd like to welcome uh, Andrew and uh, Dr. Kralicek will uh, please share your screen and uh, take it away. The stage is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Hopefully, um, thanks Andres for that kind introduction. Hopefully you can hear me and see the screen. I'm just going to go to full screen yeah, now. All beautiful. Working. All right. All good. You can see that. Okay. So thanks very much. Um, my name is Andrew Kralicek. I'm the founder and CTO of Sentient Bio. And um, Sentient is all about a new way of doing diagnostics. And that diagnostics requires a new way of describing the world, which is why we're all here today at this fantastic conference. That's volatile organic chemicals. As you know, they're everywhere. Plants, animals, humans are pumping them out. And food and other biological commodities are full of them. And they're all information about the state of these complex biological systems. They are a chemical language waiting to be interpreted. So how can we read this language? Well, at Sentient Bio, we know insects have the solution. 400 million years of evolution has produced smell receptors in insects, which are ultra sensitive for volatile organic chemicals. Simply, we can take an insect receptor and put it on a sensor platform and get over a thousand times more sensitivity than a dog and a million times more sensitive sensitivity than a human. And insects are incredibly efficient at using their receptors. Unlike dogs, which have 1,300 and humans have more than 400, this fly, for example, has only 45 receptors. And it can detect thousands of different kinds of volatile organic chemicals. The key to this being this combinatorial response, which relies on each of its receptors recognizing a unique suite of compounds and each of those compounds being recognized by a unique combination of receptors. So what's our technology about? Well, what we've done is we've been able to take these um, receptors and they're, I call them horrible membrane proteins because they're very difficult to work with. We've taken them out of cell membranes. We can make them in the lab and we've put them into a soluble form, nanodisks. And we've been able to combine them with the world's most sensitive semiconductor which is graphene. And here's an atomic force microscopy image of um, OR22A receptor in nanodisc bound to the surface of graphene. That's a nanodisc there. And if you have the graphene on the surface of a field effect transistor, when you add in a positive compound, in this case, methylhexenoate, you can see a change in the current with increasing additions of that 
particular compound. And this translates into a lovely dose response curve, which saturates at high concentrations and has a limit of detection in the femtomolar range, which is parts per quadrillion. And we know that there's specificity there because when we put in a compound the receptor shouldn't recognize, we don't get any response. So what we've been able to do is translate what we've succeeded in the lab onto a commercially scalable platform. And here's our current technology stack. So we have our odent receptor chemically linked to graphene on a field effect transistor. A volatile organic compound in liquid binds to that receptor, causing a conformational change, which affects the flow of electrons through that graphene layer, leading to a change in current that can be amplified on a chip and uh, sent to a device that converts that into digital data that can be read and interpreted by a machine learning algorithm. Now, if you have a, an array of receptors, you can take those responses and generate a VOC print, which will, will be unique for the sample that you're looking at. So Sentient Bio's uh, vision is to become the world standard for smell and taste, very much like what the red and green blue standard is for vision. And it's exciting times for research and, and doing commercial work in insect odor receptor space because we know we've got an incredible resource. There's over 200,000 different species in the world which we can mine. And maybe some of you have seen recently the recent structure of the first ever olfactory receptor. And it wasn't a dog receptor, it wasn't a human receptor, it was an insect odorant receptor. So this opens the door to engineering these receptors to detect whatever compounds you want, because now we have a scaffold to understand how amazing, how, they, how promiscuous they are in their binding and how that sensitivity is encoded. So I just want to finish up by just pointing out um, the wealth of opportunity that we have. We're currently working in the clean liquid space, um, looking at applications in the flavor and flavor and food safety. Um, but there are huge opportunities in hu uh, human and animal diagnostics, just to name a few. And finally, I just want to acknowledge um, the team working with me, Daria, Colm, Roshan, Dai, Harris, and Heather. Um, without these guys, we wouldn't be here today. And I just want to thank them for coming on this exciting journey. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, fantastic. So, so much to ask you. Uh, you know, this is very close to my heart. Uh, the field effect transistor, olfactory receptors, that's how my nose works only. Instead of graphene, we have polyprile nanotubes. For the next speaker, we have Costadinos Papa Costadino, who is, I see him, he's almost ready. He's going to talk to you about uh, sentient, very close in uh, <laughs> in uh, concept to Santa Bio, only um, uh, Costanos and I met many years ago. He is a Harvard Business School graduate, and he was running with me the Hellenic Business Network here in Boston. And uh, then we sort of kind of co-invented the Fitbit before it became a big thing. And then we had a company called Biobit, which we renamed the Fitgain, or it was Fitgain first, then it was Biobit. Then we gave up on it, and the Fitbit became something by other people, very successful thing, which we end up having nothing to do with. But uh, we've kept at it. And uh, now with uh, with um, uh, Pat, uh, with, with um, uh, uh, many people who are also on the conference, including uh, Stephen Tyler and Wen Yi and uh, Bruce uh, uh, Trock, we have created a, a startup called Sentient uh, for artificial dog intelligence based um, prostate cancer diagnostics. And he'll tell you all about that. He is the CEO. Take it away, because I didn't know you have five minutes. I'll think a little bit about it. I want to intrigue people. And uh, so I'll share the screen. Let me know if you see everything. Yep, we can see you perfectly, beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so we call the company Sentient. The website is sentient.ai. Obviously, we we're based on Sentient. We want to sniff out cancer. And uh, what we want to bring to the world is a non-invasive cancer with very, very high accuracy. So I personally, I'm not from a science background. So I used to think, I'm not a scientist. So to think that's, Diagnostic tests are very accurate, rely on them. And biopsies are free and stuff. Then my father got prostate cancer. So we had the unfortunate uh, situation where uh, doctors relied on a test, which is the gold standard for the industry. And uh, he received drugs to uh, suppress the PA. Um, and eventually uh, the, the worst thing happened. So we didn't catch the, 
uh, the cancer on time, so it metastasized. So then I found out how even doctors don't trust the gold tree. Medicine can impact levels and lead to disastrous incomes of the PSA. And uh, then looking more into it, uh, uh, I got in touch with Andreas, uh, the whole team. And uh, as we were doing research, I also found out that biopsies are in many cases for many cancers, they're unnecessary two thirds of the time. And uh, in the case of prostate cancers, they give a false negative one third of the time. So we are relying on a test that's highly inaccurate. Uh, there are diagnostics in the industry, they are very inaccurate. Something has to be done about it. Um, and solution. But before I go to the solution, just for the benefit of some of the viewers, I wanted to show you how big the problem is. Prostate cancer is a greater than $5 billion in the in the US alone. And the way it works is you get a 45 or 45 years old or, or, or older, you get a screening test. There are about 30 million PSA tests every year. Then 10% of those 3 million people, 3 million men are found with elevated a year and uh, they need to get a diagnostic in order to decide whether to proceed with a biopsy or if there's a certain... Uh, after the 3 million people who have the high PSA, they receive guidance from the urologist and the 500,000 prostate biopsies per year happen in the US of which more than 300,000 show no cancer. And these are the so-called unnecessary biopsies. And biopsy is a big deal. I mean, it's, it's not pleasant at all. It's, it's something almost barbaric that's happening in the industry, but they have to endure it. So maybe there is a solution. And here on the left, dog doctor facetiously because we are relying on the same approach that dogs take. We have, it's been proven that dogs can be trained to sniff out cancer, many different other diseases with very, very high accuracy. Uh, and that same thing, we wanna mimic the dog's approach, but we don't, what we wanna do is bring all the benefits. So high accuracy at a fraction of the cost. And the way we do that is we rely on three different things uh, that have never been done in a combination. Number one is olfaction, which is Andreas is the expert on olfaction. So he's leading uh, the way there. Uh, and we're looking at the character of scent instead of relying on markers. That's the big differentiation there. Number two, we're using the volatile organic compounds using a GCMS analysis. Uh, and then that is uh, with uh, when he's uh, contributions, it's faster, cheaper, and more convenient than other solutions. That's the biggest thing is the patented AI that we're using, uh, courtesy of Stephen Thaler, one of the, uh, one of the other co-founders, uh, who has managed to the ROS without relying on biomarkers and achieving very, very high accuracy, which improves over time. And that's another differentiation in terms of the AI we're using versus machine learning at uh, many other approaches. But the results speak for themselves. So instead of going into the details, um, the result that we have currently um, is 95% accuracy at 80% lower cost than any other diagnostic. In this chart, I'm, so, I'm showing AUC accuracy, which is the best way to compare different tests and then also breaking down between sensitivity and specificity and convenience if it needs a DRE digital rectal exam or not. So sentient our solution currently is at the very top here with 95% accuracy. And if you see PSA, which is the gold star training tool is 67% accuracy. And between those, we have the variety of diagnostics uh, that are in use currently in the market. And the best in class is the highest is 85% accuracy. But more importantly, if you see specificity is very, very low. And this is why uh, diagnostics have essentially failed in the industry. Whenever we talk to urologists, they fail because specificity, so very low predictive and also the very expensive. So like those with high specificity and very, very low cost. And uh, just, uh, just uh, to make a joke here, but wait, there's more. Um, we have something that's never been achieved before um, in the industry, which is currently um, diagnostics will tell you whether they, there is a probability that you have cancer or no. And that's not super useful for urologists. Instead, we wanted to take it a step further. We want to give it a high accuracy, we want to give it at a much lower cost, but also we want to give a lot more resolution. We want to show them what to expect if they do the biopsy. So we're bidding by Gleason score. Gleason score is uh, the aggress aggressiveness of uh, the cancer. And it's uh, classified uh, Gleason 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And uh, we have done 
with the AI that we have, we have been able to say whether you have or you don't have cancer, but also uh, how aggressive is your cancer, which can then inform uh, how the urologist will uh, do the treatment and address you. Um, and all this we've done in the last six months. Um, we're extremely excited because we're using AI that's been patented and has a very big differentiation that the more you use it, the more accurate it becomes. Uh, we're not relying on biomarkers, which, which can be unreliable and assume a linear relationship uh, in uh, the molecules whenever you're doing the analysis. Um, and we have been able to already show very high results and also very high resolution. Uh, but our vision is not to stop with prostate cancer. This is the proof of concept. And we're using this as a platform for many other cancers where biopsies are largely unnecessary. And this applies to many, many different cancers where biopsies are happening. Uh, they're very painful, very uncomfortable. They can lead to many other issues. They're very expensive for the system, but also they're very unnecessary. And I'll stop there. That, that was very efficient. Thank you, Costadino. Lots for people to unpack here. Uh, uh, please stay for the q and I'm sure people will have a lot of questions. Uh, for my next speaker, for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, Phil Sarazan, who I uh, never met in person, never saw his face uh, live before. Phil, please go to the top of your icon if you can to change your name from Osmoscape pa panelist. Uh, he can't hear me? You can't hear me. No, you cannot hear us, but can you say something? Uh, can we unmute Phil? Um, if there is a pro Matt, can you help uh, Phil uh, be heard? Uh, so, yeah, I will work with him in the chat. Okay, please work with him directly in the chat. Uh, Phil, we'll 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 skip you. Go to the next uh, Gerard if he's ready, and then we'll we'll add you to the to the to the end. But I really want to hear what you have to say. So, Gerard uh, McCall is a, a, a postdoc still, I believe, at the University of Tulane. And I hope you, we can hear you. Yes, can you unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool, cool. So him and uh, Dennis um, Bondar, Professor Bondar, and myself have a paper out, which I will link in a minute, in the physics uh, journal called Physics of Fluids, where we considered a very important uh, uh, case of, are the textbooks insane? And they are, when they talk about diffusion, meaning that the slow process of things just diffusing away being the way that smells get propagated. It's uh, not true, but he's here to tell you all about it. Jared, you got five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, can everyone see this now? Yes, cool, cool. Uh, so hi everyone, I am, uh, I'm Jared. And the first thing I should say is, as uh, Andrea said, I am not an alpha action scientist. I am not a kind of dynamic and charismatic entrepreneur. I'm the opposite of that. I am a theoretical physicist, which means I'm putting my head in the lion's mouth a bit here. Uh, so I'm telling you about some work I did with another physicist, Dennis, and Andreas, who by some incredible coincidence is the conference organiser. Uh, so <clears throat> what are we talking about here? Well, we've already heard about, you know, some of the fantastic applications of olfaction technology, you know, like cancer detecting dogs. This is my dog. Uh, she doesn't detect it with olfaction. She uses a PET scan. Uh, but, you know, we can do more than that than just simply kind of detecting what molecule it is. You know, we can also do some kind of, we know in nature that it's possible to even track scents, right? And it'd be great if we could have some kind of technology, which, you know, you have some kind of smell coming in and it can tell you where it's coming from. You know, this could be used for things like um, detecting vol volatile chemicals like explosives or being able to find your smelliest friend. Uh, this would be very useful. But the point about this is that in order to do this kind of tracking, we're, we're trying to find something that is very far away. It's non-local, it's a source. And we're having to do that from local information about you know, the scent concentration that we have where we are now. So the question is, how should we go about you know, trying to put a model of these dynamics? And you really have two options. There's fluid dynamics, which is the true thing that uh, actually describes how scents will kind of diffuse through the air. I shouldn't use the word diffuse. There's more to it than that. It's a, it's a nonlinear equation. And that means it's actually quite numerically expensive and difficult to model. So the real question was, are we actually able to capture the phenomenon of tracking a scent with much simpler equations, that is diffusion equations, which have the advantage of being analytically solvable? So how do we do this? Well, we made a kind of simple model about what would it require to track a scent. And that is, you have two conditions. You know, if you have your animal or what have you, and it's uh, kind of sniffing at separations of delta, we need two things. We need the concentration to be above some threshold. And then we also need that, you know, the ratio, the slope of this concentration should be detectable. So you know which direction to go in. 
For reference, uh, kind of this value of R in experiments, it needs to be about two. So it needs to be greater than two for something to be kind of detectable. So then we put it into the model and there are the equations that people are interested. Um, <laughs> and here are a couple of examples of what we actually ended up finding out. So here's a kind of typical example, uh, even paradigmatic. You have a shark uh, that can kind of apparently detect blood in, a drop of blood in water. And so we asked with this kind of pure diffusion model, how well does the shark do? Um, you know, when it moves some amount delta. And what we find when we kind of think of a best case scenario, this here, X max, is the maximum distance it could possibly track from. And in that range, R greater than two, what we really find is it depends a little bit on how far away the shark is between each inhalation. But, you know, it can only do it on the order of how far it moves, which really means that sharks are either, you know, lying when they can detect blood or that something magical is happening and somehow the blood as it kind of dilutes in water, its effects become stronger and sharks are in fact homeopaths. Um, that is a real place. I cannot believe it exists, but yes, the NHS does have homeopathic hospitals. Um, so you might say, okay, but you know, in real life, you know, odorants tend to have a source. They produce more and more stuff. Uh, so we thought about that as well, you know, can diffusion, if you add a source term, can that also uh, be captured, right? Can you track something if there's a constant source of odor? And so we thought about a flower field uh, producing a kind of potent odorant like linalool. Uh, and the real life threshold for this is about this blue line. And then we can go kind of smaller and smaller. So this, this kind of, this concentration green line corresponds to about four molecules per meter cubed. And so then we ask again, you know, at some maximum distance, what kind of concentration, how much odorant is having to be produced per second by this stuff? Uh, and then, then we kind of did the, did the mathematics and it turns out to kind of depend exponentially. And so the example here I would take is 25 meters that at the kind of the, the known detection threshold for humans of linalool, in order to be able to detect that from 25 meters away, the plant would need to be producing just kilograms of matter every second, which is kind of clearly impossible. So uh, what did we learn from this? Well, it was essentially trying to ask the question, can we get away with kind of these purely diffusive models for explaining scent tracking and potentially being able to implement that in future technology? And the answer is you can't, that you actually really rely on these kind of nonlinear effects that you see in the real world that kind of create these turbulent plumes and they're what you depend upon for scent tracking. I have four seconds left to just say, if you want to say, read about it, the paper is here. Thank you. <laughs> wow, That's and the prize goes to Gerard for holding it on time. Wow, thank you for that. That was awesome. Please stay for the q and A. I, we have many questions. Is uh, Phil ready? Can he speak? Okay, good. So let me start. Um, the top of your discussion is the use of olfaction sensors in smart shoes, smart boots, and smart wear. Um, the smart shoe concept was created on the assumption that after hundreds of millions of years, the pores in an animal, animal's feet evolved as one of the most effective places to eliminate potentially toxic and unusable substances. Gravity makes it more efficient to dump cellular trash at ground level and have it rubbed off the body during walking. Based on this, a preferred location to place olfactory sensors would be shoes where the concentration of volatilic organic compounds, VOCs, are high. Both Aroma Bit from Japan and Charlie Johnson at Penn State use mechanisms which blow air over the sensors so that a greater number of VOCs can reach the sensors than would otherwise reach them if the air was stagnant. For the above reasons, shoes with miniaturized electric fans should be a good way to bring VOCs laden air inside the shoe to the sensors. Shoe manufacturers use piezos to provide energy to LED lights. We could use this technology to power the airflow as well as the electronics, which include sensors, a processor, and the Bluetooth would send data to your phone. Other options to power airflow could be the use of a mechanical pump, which like the piezo is activated by walking. Along with the olfactory sensors, smart shoes could incorporate gate trackers and other smartwatch and smartware diagnostic technology. The combination of technologies will provide considerably more data to the AI than any one source. This would be a get, this would be a way to get smartware with olfaction technology onto the market at an early stage in its development. Boots can house the technology easier and more safely than shoes. Charlie Johnson at Penn State has built a brilliant sensor using graphene with pieces of DNA attached to it. The different configurations of DNA 
connect to different molecules. Andy has designed an AI. Andy has designed an AI which has a 92% detection rate for COVID and a 95% detection rate for cancer. But this hardware needs some serious downsizing before it can even become a wall mount at a senior's bedroom, never mind about a boot. The National Institute of Health has given them money to do so. Aromabit has miniaturized their technology, but it is a ways off before it can equal the effic efficacy of a dog's nose. Maybe a, a cooperative effort can fast track product development for both companies. The air in a semi-enclosed boot is continually recycled uh, till the sensors acquire the appropriate information, then the air is expelled. Pending the type of sensor, the expulsion of air could be possibly be used among other methods to clean the sensors. The goal would be to design the airflow so as to make the boot not only a good diagnostic tool, but also more comfortable. I can imagine women's boot manufacturers will create some out of this world Star Trek fashion designs to incorporate the technology. An airflow system powered by walking is fine for active people. Those who are less active will need a larger battery in the boot and or a bigger mechanical pump and or mats that one can stand on which charge the battery. The old fashioned technology is still in its early stage of development but could be ready by the time the airflow for the boot is designed. Once we develop an e-nose, which matches the efficacy of a dog's nose and fits into a pair of boots, we can start thinking about an e-nose that equal a bear's nose, which is five to seven times better than the best bloodhound. Smartware that duplicates a dog's nose will determine when we are infected by disease. We can speculate that the smartware which duplicates a bear's nose will help us detect who around us has an infectious disease and how far away from that person we should be to avoid receiving a viral load which will make us sick. We soon may stop being blind folks in this game of chemical billiards. Different smartware, different smart clothing items working as a unified system will provide us with a far more space to incorporate olfactory technology, especially with smart winter clothing, which will help us detect harmful diseases more prevalent in that season. The smartware could have innovative pesos integrated into the coats and pants so as to power the airflow and the electronics with movements of arms and legs. Thanks everybody for the opportunity of this amazing new field of medicine, science and discovery. Thank you again. Thank you, Phil. We can hear you. We can. We heard everything. You're doing well. I hope you can hear us. If not, uh, I, I will uh, please come to the Q&A and Matt, please work with Phil in the background to get uh, him to hear us too. I'm sure people have questions. Next and final for this session is uh, Stephanie Brenner. And she is uh, coming from, uh, I believe, uh, Israel to us from, uh, right? From uh, 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 Professor Noam Sobel's lab where I visited, where in, in addition to being one of the, perhaps possibly the best lab for olfaction, and uh, especially when it comes to actually uh, bringing in humans uh, into this business uh, on the planet, uh, they also have a blind cat who is part of the lab. And this blind cat clearly does a lot of things, including hunting, using their uh, his ears and nose. So Stephanie's going to talk to us about um, uh, e-nose sensors for urine. Stephanie, yeah, five minutes, take it away. Great. Uh, can everyone see the presentation? Yes, Great. it's Thanks perfect. Thanks for the kind introduction and thank you all the speakers for this amazing conference. Um, so like Andrea said, I will be presenting today a system for improving incontinence care using e-nose technology. So over 50% of elderly care home residents suffer from incontinence. Now, a number of companies have attempted to solve this, namely by using a smart diaper. So two of the main diaper companies, Pampers and Huggies, came out a couple of years ago with a smart diaper technology, either using RFID chips or temperature humidity sensors. However, they seem to have shifted away from real-time incontinence detection and gone more towards sleep tracking with their smart diapers. Uh, on the right, we see two um, potentially better offers who are actually focusing on adult incontinence care, not so much on babies, with Smarty and Ontex. Uh, both of them are using strips that get inserted into the diaper. In the case of Ontex, they actually print it directly onto the diaper, but this means you have to purchase their diapers to be able to use the technology. Uh, in all of these cases, 
we're basically monitoring moisture content, and that is about the extent of the information that can be gathered from that data. So none of these sensors will be able to say something deeper about a patient's health or reading any sort of biomarkers. So to develop something that's a little more holistic and informative of a solution, we're looking at using the PEN3 ENOS to identify incontinence. So this project hinges on using the PEN3 ENOS from AirSense company in Germany. And their, their technology is based on 10 metal oxide sensors. Uh, you can see here what that output looks like. You get a 10 channel time series for whatever duration you are measuring for, in my case, 50 seconds. And here are examples of what a, the output looks like for feces, urine, and blank samples. So looking at the efficacy of this, the ENOS can actually identify real feces and urine at 91% accuracy. On the left, we're looking at a graph which is depicting that sensor data uh, projected onto the principal component one and two space. The solid circles are showing the real class of each sample, and the outlines are representing the predicted class using a linear SVM classifier. So what we're hoping to see, if it was working at 100%, blue would be outlined in blue, yellow with yellow, red with red. And you can see, for example, some of the mistakes. And these actually are from samples that were measured in a slightly more realistic fashion. So let's say it's a fresher sample or not as close to the ENO sampling tube as others. And we're going to get into that in a, in a bit. Over here, we're seeing a depiction of which sensors are uh, most important in delivering information out of the 10 inside of the ENOS. So as expected, um, blank shows very little activation in this graph of average maximum activation per sensor per sample, uh, followed by urine with more and feces as the highest activation, which is also mirrored on the graph on the left, where each one does have a sort of cluster. Um, what's more interesting here, however, is that we can see not all of these sensors are important in answering this question of detecting feces in urine. In fact, almost half of the sensors in this specific ENOS are irrelevant. And that's great for us in terms of creating future iterations of this device to make it simpler and smaller. So now we get into actually putting a device at patient bedside that can be a real-time olfactory detection of incontinence in stationary settings. So some of the problems that we've discovered already with simply putting this ENOS next to a patient is um, the most important thing is that the sample cannot be more than a few millimeters far away from the hose of the ENOS. Uh, otherwise, it will simply not detect it. Um, and this is good for stability inside, but yields problems when trying to adapt it for a real environment. Uh, second of all, it thrives on measuring headspace and measuring the volatiles built up in that headspace. So we need to make sure that there is some kind of an enclosed space to build that up. And finally, the total distance away from the endpoint to the ENOS itself can't be too far because the internal pump in the ENOS won't be strong enough to bring enough odor. So we've built a supplementary hardware system to help the ENOS succeed in these drawbacks. Uh, on a basic level, there is a stronger pump that pulls air into an air chamber where it collects and the ENOS actually samples from that chamber. So this solves the problem of having um, a headspace that can build up in that air chamber and the pump can actually bring enough odor all the way from the patient to the ENOS. Finally, a special patient pad allows us to bring the ENOS sampling hose as close to the important area of measurement on the patient. So this can currently detect incontinence and send live alerts to nurses and staff, um, but it has future capabilities of detecting disease states, understanding other biomarkers, and giving a bigger picture of gastrointestinal health of any patient that uses the device. So thanks for listening, and I'll be open for questions after. Wow, you managed to pack so much actual science and engineering into five minutes. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, amazing. Very, very, very well done. I would like to now bring up all the panelists and pin them up and uh, uh, questions from the audience. I would like some help from uh, uh, any of my uh, uh, my team here, whether it's uh, Nikhil or Carolina, who can maybe um, uh, read the questions or allow the people to speak themselves. I have a couple that I saw coming in uh, already via email that you might not have seen, and some of them are actually for me. And the, the, the first are actually are both for Stephanie and for Gerald, because you're both talking about how close something must be in order to be sensed. 
Now, uh, one answer that people always say is, well, just make the nose more sensitive. But to track something and to be able to see those deltas and know where it's coming from, even if you have the, the world's you know, bare nose, as Phil suggested, you'd still need to be able to move left and right and have make this the, uh, determination of difference to know which, is, which patient it's coming from. So this is a problem that we always have when we think of a smoke alarm type setting for let's say if you put it in a hospital and see who's, uh, who needs a diaper change. Okay, so you put it up on the ceiling and you hope that you get it differentially. So there seems to be a fundamental physical limit there that uh, Jared has talked about. And uh, you seem, um, uh, Stephanie, to be solving it with technology. So I was hoping to hear what ideas can we come up with to that aren't just make the nose more sensitive because that's not good enough. If we were to have it in a setting like this, how do would you track where the scent is coming from? I know I'm putting you on the spot because I don't know the answer to that. But <laughs> either Stephanie or Gerard or anybody else from the speakers in our audience can, can go for it. Yeah, that is a true concern with uh, adapting these things for real environments as opposed to simple lab work. Um, I think that uh, anyone who's working on this for now is sort of limited to making personal devices. So, you know, an Eno sitting at patient bedside, um, uh, a device clipped onto the pants or wherever a personal uh, cell phone, um, even sensors that are being put inside of toilets, which would be localized, you know, per person who sits there. Um, but as far as putting something in, the, in a larger room that will have some kind of directionality, that starts to get really complicated to be able to give any kind of personalized information. And this is also the comment that a lot of uh, 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 engineering companies such as Aromabit who are very impressive in their vision where they want to put a sensor everywhere in the fridge and the toilet and the car, et cetera. Um, this is why I think a, a lot of people are, are looking into phones and smartwatches because it's already kind of as close as, as you're gonna get. And the phone is an intimate object. People literally sleep with it sometimes. Um, and I said literally, and I know I, I'm, I'm using the word literally correctly. Now, <laughs> um, for um, uh, I have a question that came from me for, for Stephanie. Yeah, your your metal oxide receptors that did not, or sensors that did not fire, were not um, interested in that particular volatile. Do, are they interested in other volatiles? How do you tune them? What is the difference between the different uh, metal oxide uh, uh, pads that you have? Yes, so each of the ones that come with the basic you know, that you can order are coded with different, uh, with different coding specific for different molecules. It's not as nice as sensor one equals sulfur, sensor two equals turpentine. Uh, if only it was this great, it's something more like uh, it is sensitive to uh, compounds with benzene rings. Uh, so uh, it's basically up to us to work on the algorithms end to say this time series is this smell, um, but others, other odors will um, bring up signals in all 10 sensors or some other subset of the sensors. These ones specifically that uh, fired here are more sensitive towards sulfur and methane. So understandably, they are our important sensors. <laughs> yeah, cool. I have a, quite, I have a, a raised hand from, uh, I believe it's Susan. Susan needs to rename herself. Is that you, Susan? Yes, it's me. Okay. So, yes. Uh, metal, metal oxide sensors are extremely sensitive to humidity. Are you, mm -hmm. have you done a humidity control on this? And the other issue is sensitivity because most of metal oxide sensors um, are not particularly sensitive. They certainly can't detect hydrogen. Most of them can't detect hydrogen sulfide or parts per trillion, for, for example, mm -hmm. which is the reason why you need something close. But the humidity issue is one that is, a real problem as is saturation. Have you looked into either of those issues? Yes, so I, um, we know humidity usually tends to make these results go out the door. Um, but so far, at least in my testing uh, with real feces, real urine, we the traces that you found there are, are real urine. Um, I've also done this with chemicals and obviously that's a more far more beautiful curve. Um, but with the real thing, it still detects the volatiles that are important. And of course, you're not getting a massive signal, but you are getting a signal that is not the same as blank. Um, so, so far, humidity has not thwarted these efforts. Sorry to pile on on Stephanie, but apparently your, your talk generated a lot of interest. I'm going, I'm going to read you what the next question is, and then I'm going to go to, to Pat's question for Andrew. Where, uh, the next question is from uh, Anisha. Uh, Peters, and she asks, how thin is the pad, and can it be in a uh, panty liner format, an ultra thin layer? Is that possible? I missed the first part of what you said. 
uh, how thin is your pad and could, could you make it thin enough to be in a panty liner format slash ultra thin layer? Yes, so the pad is designed to be a replacement for the pads that are currently placed under patients in elderly homes. Uh, it's also designed to have a little bit of extra padding and, and squish so that it, a patient can't feel that tube going underneath them because the tubing will have to get all the way to the center area of interest. Um, so it needs to be made a little more comfortable. Uh, of course, that's specific to this design. Um, something like this, the purpose of the pad is to bring the tubing uh, closer to mm -hmm. the patient. So mm -hmm. if we're talking tubing, that wouldn't be so comfortable to put inside of underwear, but it could be adapted uh, to, to be some other kind of material that goes in the underwear. Yeah, I, I think maybe it, it has something uh, to consider from Phil's idea also. The shoes are much bigger than, than uh, I guess, the underwear areas. <laughs> so perhaps there's the space there, including in the sole. I've seen shoes that have an air sole. That air sole could double up as a, uh, as a chamber for odorants. So something to think about there. The next question is from Pat to Andrew. Can you elaborate on how you in isolate and harvest the insect receptors? And are these receptors universal across all species? Yeah, sure. I just want to first hand on heart. So I'm not a serial killer of insects. Um, what we do is we clone um, these receptors and um, we express them in insect uh, cell lines. Uh, we grow them up. We smash open those um, those uh, those cells. We purify them from that, put them into detergent, and then we manipulate them into nano discs. Um, with regarding are these receptors universal across all species? That's a, a big question. Um, because um, these receptors are incredibly diverse in their sequence. So it's very hard to correlate looking at just the sequence. Um, we're sure that there are similar kinds of receptors all across those species, but you wouldn't be able to pick them up on a, um, just by looking at the homology side of things, the sequence of those receptors. Um, yeah, they're incredible receptors. Yeah, so, okay, so I'm pulling up. I, I'm, I was just told by our controlling board that we have a lot. Uh, we got 15 more minutes for, for Q&A, which uh, means you guys are on the spot. I'm going to grill you, so that's awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I think maybe this is a winning combination, a winning uh, format now, too. It looks like the audience is very interested, so to cut it off at five minutes or two minutes, maybe maybe it's a good thing to have five minutes of speakers and then longer Q&A. Uh, everybody's being very smart and respectful here, so I love it. Um, so, Andrew, uh, to, to your point, the the thank you for not killing so many insects. That's great. I'm so glad that uh, Pat asked this question. I'm, I too make uh, olfactory receptors uh, synthetically. So we never, we use rat, uh, human, and mouse. We've never used dog, although we probably should. Uh, we've never used shark. Although <laughs> if Jared has anything to say about this, well, next there will be shark. Uh, but all that all it means is that you start off on the internet, you download the, the gene sequence, the, um, uh, the uh, primary sequence in uh, nucleotides, ATGC, that codes for the amino acids that go into uh, creating a 300 amino acid, roughly long protein. And then you basically outsource that. You do some tweaking at that point. You can do some tweaking to make it easier to isolate later. For instance, you can add a raw tag at one of the terminals. And then you outsource that to a company uh, that will give you back that DNA. So far, you've touched no animals, okay? It's all ticket ticket on the internet, okay? The DNA comes back also synthetic. It comes back in powder form. It's stable for 10,000 years on your shelf. That DNA then gets put through a sequence of steps that takes about four hours to create living proteins. And then, of course, you have to purify them. And the more work you put up front to create them with an easily purifiable uh, um, hook that, that you can grab onto, the better you, you're off. Uh, it is a process, and we expect people to be making them into... Uh, like a SIM card type format, uh, by buying them like a packs of gum, a replay, or, or better, better, better knowledge would be packs of uh, film really for a camera because a nose is a camera for molecules. And uh, the currently the sensing pad, unlike uh, Stephanie's, which I presume the metal oxide uh, uh, pads can be regenerated. They don't get too dirty or you can heat them up, but, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong at the end of this. Um, but yeah, the, uh, your nose, you should know your epithelium gets replenished every two weeks. You have a a bunch of uh, stem cells there that create new olfactory sensor neurons. This is the same thing that happens to your retina. People don't realize this, that your retina and your nose are consumables. They're like printer paper or like a film and a camera. They get used up and then you get a new nose and a new retina every two weeks. This is why sometimes you've heard stories of the sun gazers. It's a religion that likes to look at the sun and sometimes they go blind and then, oh, miracle, two weeks later they can see again. Well, that's because they burned off the retina cells, but just the front layer and then they did not burn off the, the uh, the capillaries that provide the oxygen and the 
and the trophic factors necessary to rebuild it. So if you go, if you stare at the sun for too long, you'll go blind for good. But if you don't, if you just burn off a little bit of your retina, you have a good chance of having full vision again, similar to your nose, which I've had done to myself. I've had my olfactory epithelium completely ablated and removed. And I went anosmic for two weeks and it was a weird time. Let me tell you, even, even uh, my sense of space changed. So I did not realize this, but I would walk into my apartment and I was wondering, oh, was that angle at 90 degrees always like that? <laughs> Very strange things happened to me. Um, I did not do it just for science. I had an actual procedure done on my nose, uh, the byproduct of which was that they would completely remove the uh, olfactory epithelium. So um, I want to know, Andrew, from uh, what can we, what, 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 is it easier for the, for the insect receptors to work? They're not GPCR, or they are GPCRs, right? Or are they not? They're ORCO, right? They're, they're a little bit easier to work. They're more easy to stabilize. Plus in real life, they're, they're on the antenna of the insect. So they're closer, I think. I mean, they don't have this mucus layer that we have to protect it. They don't have to always have the same, you know, very humid and very warm air. Is that correct? Is that part of the reason you went after that? Um, so let me, what was the first question? <laughs> I don't know, I've forgotten. <laughs> okay, I'll start with the last question. Um, yeah. I might remember who's coming. So, um, oh, yeah. sorry, I remember so, the first question. So, Somebody reminded me here. Hold on, hold on, Carolina. Thank you, Carolina. She's my external brain. Uh, <laughs> Carolina reminded me that Pat asked, "Are the receptors universal across all species?" I think. Well, I, I, I think I kind of answered that. I think your question mm -hmm. was, um, "You said that these proteins were G protein coupled receptors. Oh, um, mm -hmm. they they're not. They're totally mm -hmm. different to mammalian receptors. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned mm -hmm. ORCO, the uh, co-receptor, which is an ion channel subunit. So the ligand binding, uh, the the receptor itself interacts with an ion channel and turns it on. Right. So um, they're totally different." Um, the second question. Now I've lost the second question. <laughs> oh, well, how, they work the, if, how they work in the intake? In the intake, right, whether, right? Whether and whether you the, the fact that they're not encased in a snout uh, helps yep. you and in, in your stability. Because I do not know how long it takes for the insect to regenerate their antenna if they didn't do that. I, I I'm not sure, and maybe somebody in the audience may have an idea, but I'm not sure how long it takes to regenerate. But you've got to imagine you've got an antenna. On that antenna, you've got these very fine hairs and called sensilla, and within those hairs are olfactory sensory neurons. There's tiny pores in those hairs which let um, uh, odorants come in. They get solubilized by odorant binding proteins and ferried to the receptor on the olfactory sensory neuron membrane. So they're a very contained environment. So totally different to what you're talking about in terms of the nose and the mucus layer and everything like that. Mm -hmm. They're very well protected and they're very efficient. And it's actually a very efficient design to navigate three-dimensional space, right? There's things sticking out there with um, some cilia all over it, which can pick it up. They don't dry down. They don't have problems with that um, because they're, they're self-contained. Um, yeah, and I guess we went for insects because they've been around a lot longer in terms of using these kind of receptors. Um, and as I mentioned previously, there's a plethora of species out there which we can mine, right? Um, yeah. Very cool, very cool. I see Jared has a, his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, so I, I, I hate to be going back to Stephanie again, but I was just thinking about this. Uh, I, I kind of had two questions. Um, the first one is on that uh, principal component analysis kind of SVM you do. And you use two dimensions. But if you're using a linear SVM, you would imagine that, you know, more dimensions means better linear separability. So is there a reason why you only stick to the first two components in that? So the PC was just for visualization purposes. Um, mm -hmm. I've also put it on three-dimensional PCA space. Uh, basically, it doesn't add too much more detail in terms of just visualizing uh, what that space looks like, but it's just to make a, a better picture so you can really see what those what that data naturally clusters into. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, one, one more follow-up about this is that you're testing to try and find consonants. How well does it do on kind of false positives like flatulence? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, very Absolutely. good. Yes, <laughs> you are correct. That is definitely a concern uh, in this design. So the testing that has happened so far has been uh, outside of the final setup of the whole pad with the external pump and all of this extra hardware. Um, so it hasn't been tested on a, on a real subject yet. Uh, it's been tested on basically collecting uh, realistic samples in lab and putting them in realistic settings as in in diapers and this kind of thing through layers of clothing uh, but we haven't tested it on an actual subject where we would be having uh, examples of flatulence and other such things um, ideally we'll be able to 
figure out how to test that in the lab before getting to that stage as well. So that will be coming up. Cool. Um, very cool. So uh, I, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, we can come back to this. Uh, there's a few more questions uh, coming in. I want to ask Kostadinos about uh, his journey here. So uh, uh, he has been uh, very active in trying to uh, uh, convince uh, people from business and even diagnostics, even doctors, uh, about the value of doing it, uh, doing diagnostics via scent. And I want to ask him, what is it, in your opinion, that was the biggest obstacle that you, you've overcome and you're, or perhaps you're still facing? Is it the fact that people just freak out about thinking that we're trying to put dogs in their office, uh, doctor's office, or is it something else? Because a lot of it has to do with this imagery of the dog, and a lot of it has to do with convincing people to, to look at it. And we know of its value. We know that it's there. But somehow, we, 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 you know, I've, I've seen you face a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback. Yeah, there is a lot of PR that needs to be done around uh, scent and diagnostics or scent and many other applications, I think. It's just educating people that it's so powerful when they hear that dogs have been trained to sniff out cancer without talking about accuracy. They're like, how do they do that? They don't believe it. They're like, uh, how robust is it? There are so many questions and then you have to talk about the different studies. Are they peer reviewed? And then you show the peer reviewed studies. It's, uh, and then you waste all your time explaining can dogs actually do it versus actually pitching your idea, which is based on that. So I think the whole industry has to do a lot more like Osmo Cosmo, I think is a great starting point to get more investors involved with scent and realize its power. There are some amazing startups and amazing ideas here. And the more we get it out there and explain it in layman's terms, the more unscientific you are and bringing up the idea of dog as a doctor and that triggers something. And yes, they don't like it, but then they want you to explain it. And when they get it, when they have an aha moment, that's really powerful. And then they admire it to the idea and they can become your evangelists, which I've seen as well. Yes, I, and we have some VCs in the audience and some entrepreneurs too. And I think uh, it, um, uh, I don't know where the sector is, if there even is a sector for scent based diagnostics. I know there's some volatile uh, diagnostic devices out there that have not been doing very well. For 40 years, people have been promo promoting things like breath analysis for lung cancer. And it always gets bound, uh, bogged down in a couple of things. One is uh, the fact that you can't take it out of the lab. As, as Stephanie has uh, explained, as uh, Jared has explained, this diffusion uh, is problematic. The fact that scents are very complex in the way that they move, but also the fact that you get all this noise and uh, you need a clean environment for, for these kind of analysis to work, the ones that work on biomarkers. The second one is, in fact, that, that people are still stuck on this idea that a scent is made of volatile organic compounds. No, the scent rides on volatile organic compounds. It's the same as saying, uh, the meaning of a Shakespeare play is made of fonts. No, the words and the fonts is what it rides on. The meaning is what you extract. As Anne Sophie Barwich, Professor Barwich was telling us this morning, the meaning comes, definitely rides on some kind, the signal rides on a carrier, which happens to be volatile organic comp uh, compounds here, but the meaning is not the compound. If you identify every compound, that's like saying, okay, I've taken a, a, a sonnet by Shakespeare and I've or reorganized it by uh, word length, and by word incidents. And now I give you a list of all the words that con are contained in there and tell you how many times they appear. Well, that doesn't tell you much, okay? The dog isn't doing any chemistry. The uh, uh, um, he, um, Hippocrates, which I think Susan will correct me for the date, whatever date it was that Hippocrates was uh, uh, talking about, I think uh, probably in uh, 400 or so BC, uh, he had this method of asking his, the, you know, the father of, med of Western medicine had this method of asking the patients to spit on uh, uh, on uh, on hot coals, and then describe to his students if their breath, if their spit now as it evaporates from the hot coals smells of rancid beer, then they have pneumonia. If it doesn't, they have something else. Uh, that kind of thing. It's the scent character that carries a lot of information. So uh, yes, yeah, Susan, you have your hand up. Please correct me. Yes, right here with I that. think the, I think that the problem is direction. I thought you said exactly the right thing, Andres. Is that directionality is the problem? You're going to be confounded. Mm -hmm by other compounds. And directionality is done by the fifth cranial nerve and not the first cranial nerve. It's a different nerve. So if you feel irritation in your nose, that's what allows you to know what direction something is coming from. And what I think needs to be done here is to combine the olfactory portion with the irritation, what the so like the pungency portion, because the pungency is what allows you to know the directionality. I love and, it. That is so yeah. smart. <laughs> and so, so to me, an e-nose in itself um, 
is not in itself enough, okay? What you have to do is to be able to know about the irritation. And this has to do with trip channels and ASIC channels yeah. and all the other things that are not incorporated into this whole issue of, of the enos. And that's, that's where in the lies the problem. And what we need to be able to do, for example, I mean, it, we have to be able to do our irritation thresholds. And the problem with this is that irritation increases over time. For example, if you're downwind from a hog farm, which I know a lot about because I've worked on a lot of them, you know, you're not going to get irritation right at the beginning. It builds up over time, but it's that irritation and that fifth cranial nerve that allows you the directionality. And so unless we Absolutely. combine the two, yeah. that's where it has to be solved. That is so beautiful. I, 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 I would love for you to talk to Professor uh, Simi Foster, who happens to also be my wife, who happens to also be talking on Saturday about trip channels. And she has done her whole PhD many years ago uh, on neuroimmune interactions and uh, how relevant is that and how happy I'm that you, you said this. Uh, and I see Chris has his hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, the, a very, uh, what might appear to be a, a naive question, a simple question. Um, I think all of you, I'd like to put uh, one question to all of the panelists, and uh, we seem to keep returning to the issue of uh, it's not the material or the substance of the uh, scent that um, we're measuring, but what we ultimately want to know is what it means. Uh, Andreas was talking about the carrier wave idea, and I think engineers are familiar with that. So I'd like to put one question to each of our panelists, and that is, um, how do you extract meaning from your own work at this stage? Uh, well, Phil hasn't spoken. I don't know if he's still with us. If you can say something, I know that Phil, who I hope he can hear me, I don't see him anymore, but he is this uh, uh, powerful uh, dynamo of nature who found me out and he's from Canada and he started connecting me with all these companies and re reporting on, on things that other people did that I had, had fallen off my radar. And I'm so, so happy for him to, to have been here. And I'm so sorry that he's not, he can't speak, but uh, yeah, he, he definitely extracts a lot of meaning out of his work, I think, by just being a super helpful guy who, who's, who's yeah. going to help us uh, <laughs> be the tide that ra raises all boats. So when this is recorded, I hope Phil can, can hear me saying these things about him. So carry on, there, is, he, is he coming? No. Okay, so, but the rest of you, the question was posed by Chris, how do you extract meaning from your work? I think I'd like to open it up to the emotional level too. It doesn't have to be just how does Stephanie gets meaning out of her MOX receptors, but perhaps you can talk to me about how you get meaning out of your work, Jerry. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I think I'm gonna have the simplest answer, which is that I don't get meaning out of it. I get predictions. And in this model, the predictions don't match reality. So. Uh -huh. All right, so, so it's a little bit of a vindication, huh? <laughs> Physics wins. <laughs> when you do it right, by the way, people have been talking about uh, smell going via diffusion forever. Uh, similar to how old textbooks say that the human can discriminate 10,000 cents. Stephanie, don't believe it. Okay, the young of you the, don't believe that. That is a nonsense uh, number. Nobody's ever counted. And it's not even a countable thing. It's as silly as asking how many sites can you discriminate? Well, depends. If I'm a painting expert, I can go and uh, and uh, and uh, study all the paintings in the Louvre. I think we have Stephen Thaler asking a question. Yes, Stephen, go ahead. Unmute yourself, please. Go ahead. Nope, we can't hear you. Uh, Matt, can you unmute Stephen Thaler? There he is. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Welcome. Well, regarding the uh, the meaning issue, uh, Walter Freeman, who I'll talk about tomorrow, the UC Berkeley professor, uh, repeatedly you know, used this idea of meaning being the currency of the brain. And uh, the thing is, well, you can uh, you know, classify uh, chromatograms or whatever you want, uh, sensor arrays, uh, but it has to go to higher levels. It has to associate, you know, across the board, all the different cortical patches have to get involved, all the sensory channels. And that's where the meaning arises. The problem is that there is no AI, well, I take that back, there is now, that can essentially emulate whole cortical function. We're talking about 100 billion neurons and integrating uh, all the different sensory impressions across a synthetic cortex. So that's what I'm going to be introducing tomorrow during my talk. 
Yes, thank you, Stephen. And if you scroll up in the chat, I've linked to something that I cannot wait for you to learn. So I'm going to tell you now. Uh, Stephen's AI called Dabus has received personhood status for the purposes of invention by a Supreme Court in Australia and I think South Africa also. This is a historic moment. You're in the presence of the true father of AI here. We're talking about a machine that is treated as a person. Uh, yeah, Stephen, say again. <laughs> Sorry to steal wow. your thunder. I had to say it. He will speak uh, tomorrow okay. live. <laughs> but go ahead. Do you have something? Well, the hands up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, there is no absolute significance to any kind of sensory input. It is invented. And thus the commonality with systems that can autonomously create new inventions. If you're sensing, you're inventing an interpretation. So that's oh. another point I'll probably make tomorrow. Oh, I like that a lot. If you're sensing, you're inventing. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that goes into the um, book of quotes. Uh, just, Feel free. Just one thing to clarify what I meant by um, uh, where does the meaning lie? I'm using the word meaning in the sense of phenomenology where meaning is a relational property. So um, it's not something intrinsic to the human. Um, it's to do with the relationship between you and other things. So uh, it's the interaction between you and the world. And that seems to be the closest we've got at the moment. I think you and Steve are agreeing. Steven just said that his machine is sensing and inventing and it's deriving meaning from this, uh, I guess, uh, assignment of a, for lack of a better word, uh, stories, I guess. There has to be a story yeah, yeah. that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you learn something, yeah. and that's the meaning. So it's very interesting. Um, well, it is, it so, is all relational. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's dynamic, too. So in, in my nose, what we've learned is that the, the, the silliest thing I did, which I thought was silly in the beginning, and I was very embarrassed about it, it was that I was not looking for molecules, even though I thought originally that the nose has to be an analytical tool where you can train it to one molecule at a time and then combine those into a graph and all that. But I didn't have time. And, and my nose uh, was uh, uh, had to be tested at DARPA under uh, this uh, large project that I was running for MIT called the MIT Real Nose. And uh, DARPA had all these very you know uh, rigid conditions about we couldn't even touch our machines that had to be behind glass. I had to be followed into the bathroom by, by a guard Believe it or not, yes. So I didn't do something. Anyway, it was it was this very uh, controlled environment, and but they had, but they had told us which molecules we were going to test us on up front, so we could train the machines on them. And I didn't have time to actually calibrate each molecule. So all I did was I had these pads. Of course, the machine back then was much bigger, uh, and Pat is here who helped us build it, and he's built all the electronics. And uh, just like um, Stephanie's machine, we had different pads. Only we had GPCRs on them, similar to Andrew's machine, which has uh, uh, insect olfactory receptors. We had uh, mammalian olfactory receptors. We also had a field effect transistor architecture, and this was in 2010. Uh, and we just looked at the patterns. There was no theory to tell us which way the current would go uh, for a given interaction between a receptor and an odorant. We didn't know. Nobody knew. And in fact, it's still a mystery. You can't predict from any theory that we know currently. I would really love to, to see if we could do this. But uh, you have to do the experiment. Once you do the experiment, for that same voltage bias, if you have a field effect transistor, the same combination of odorant and receptor will always cause the same deviation in the current, either up or down or flat. If you're unlucky enough to have the, the humidity playing against you, you might even get a flat signal, even though you're actually getting a signal. So there's no way to tell. There was no way to train. There's nothing in the theory. So we just recorded the, uh, the patterns. And then we had this idea that uh, let's hierarchically prune this so that the first uh, instance, we had a, a 16 channels. The first channel would measure something roughly. And then while the molecules were flying to the next channel via its tube, we reset the parameters there to measure based on the results of the first one. And then it ended up being that that's actually the encoding mechanism that biology has invented. So our patent predates the discovery of the biological thing. And this is what I call reverse biomimicry. Uh, we could have told the biologists looking for the way that the olfactory information is encoded in the brain and in the sensory apparatus if they had studied our machine. But I was embarrassed. I wasn't actually going to publish this. We put it in the patent, but I was like, yeah, this is a hack because I don't know what molecules this is, but it ended up being prescient. That was the key to it. That was why the nose, our nose works so well is because it's looking at meaning. It's looking at meaning that is locally available. It doesn't try to get you to the mechanics of which volatile organic compound means what. And something that was asked of um, Claire Guest earlier, our keynote speaker, somebody asked a very good question. How do you know that the dogs are picking up the same thing? Well, we don't. In fact, we know the opposite is happening. When you train a dog on prostate cancer, one question arises is, what do you use as a control? 
And one idea we had was, well, why don't we use um, uh, a, a, a urine from females? Females don't have a prostate, so logic dictates that perhaps there's much less uh, chance of them generating a false positive. Well, true enough, the dog started hitting 100%. And if anything's 100% right, it's 100% wrong. That should be very, very suspicious, right? Every machine, every system will have a mistake. If you don't make a mistake, that means you haven't tried it enough times. If you, if you get 100% for 100 trials, well, do a thousand trials. If you're still getting a thousand out of a thousand, go 10,000 until you start finding where your error rate is. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. So, in any case, the dogs started hitting 100%, not because they were so well trained, but because they reconfigured what they were triggering in, what the meaningful thing for them was on the fly. They realized, oh, what this guy wants is the non female urine. And that's, of course, much easier to find than the prostate cancer urine. But in the background of all female urine, they reconfigured their sensing. Uh, modality. They reconfigured what's meaningful to them because we can't see inside the dog's head. Similar to we can't see inside Stephen Fowler's hidden layer very easily. We don't know what artificial intelligence is doing in the middle. It's not so important to, to know which volatile it is. It might be different volatiles with different parts. And as Noam Sobel has shown, you can get to the same thing many, many ways. You can have olfactory white assembled from very different components. So I think this is coalescing very, very well for a very strong signal and meaningful signal for all of us to take into the next session, which I think I think if everybody has has had their chance to speak, I'm I'm glad to entertain everybody else. I'm now I'm just running out. The